During the 19th century, it was all too commonplace to see alternative medicines being offered as cure-alls for ailments suffered by the general public. The dangerous poison strychnine was handed out as a performance enhancer for athletes, heroin was presented as a fix for unwell children, and cocaine was used to treat alcoholism, with Sigmund Freud himself calling the substance a medical drug. It was widely available in powder form, wines, and even soft drinks. Thankfully, in 2023, medicine has come a long way. But back then, science was not so advanced, and the general public didn't have access to information the way we do today. As a result, they were often misinformed and relied on those who sold themselves as doctors. One of the most nightmarish figures of the late 19th and early 20th century who masqueraded as a health professional was a woman by the name of Linda Hazard. This is Cold Case Detective. Hazard was born Linda Lauren Burfield on December 18, 1867, in the small city of Carver, nestled along the banks of the Minnesota River. While today the city has almost 6,000 residents, back in the 1860s it had a population of just over 700 people. Hazard was the oldest child, born to Susanna Neal and Montgomery Burfield, and had six siblings. At the age of 18, she married and went on to give birth to two children. But in 1898, she left her family behind to return to Minnesota, where she pursued a medical career. Hazard never attended university and never acquired a medical degree, but she managed to nab a medical license for herself in the state of Washington by exploiting a loophole that saw alternative medicine practitioners being exempt from more modern regulations. Hazard was a staunch believer in therapeutic fasting. According to her book, The Science of Fasting, she spent a great deal of time studying under Edward Hooker Dewey, a doctor who advocated for fasting and invented the No Breakfast Plan, wherein he argued that people should only consume two meals a day and they should give up breakfast, claiming that disease and physiological problems were the result of excessive eating. He believed fasting could even cure mental health issues. However, many doctors disagreed with Dewey's takes. In 1910, the British Medical Journal described him as not an accurate or careful writer, as he had written many medical errors throughout his books. They also labelled his claims that fasting was a cure-all for disease as a foolish delusion. Other doctors noted that fasting should only be carried out under medical supervision. Hazard, however, was uninterested in the criticism levied against her mentor. She developed her own fasting method that she claimed was a remedy for all sorts of illnesses. Using her technique, one could supposedly rid themselves of toxins which caused imbalances in the body. In 1908, aged 41, she published her first book, Fasting for the Cure of Disease, and nine years later she released her second, Diet in Disease and Systematic Cleansing. In 1927, her first publication was re-released using the title Scientific Fasting, The Ancient and Modern Key to Health. In her books, Hazard wrote that the cause of all illness lay in food, something she picked up from her mentor. She stated, Appetite is craving, hunger is desire. Craving is never satisfied, but desire is relieved when want is supplied. She believed that the path to good health and long life was to let the digestive system rest by fasting. Despite both Hazard and Dewey receiving disapproval from the wider medical community, the public found the concept of fasting interesting, and it was seen as trendy to partake in it. The success of Hazard's written work helped her to establish a specialized hospital called Wilderness Heights in Olala, Washington. Inside the walls of Wilderness Heights, inpatients fasted for days, weeks, and even months. Their diets consisted of tiny portions of various fruit and vegetable juices and broths. What they were eating was, unsurprisingly, nowhere near enough to sustain them, 
especially since the broth often consisted of a tomato placed in hot water and then removed before the broth was served to patients. While some patients survived their trip to the hospital and would then publicly endorse Hazard's methods, many died while in her care. In defense of her techniques, Hazard would tell people that those who died had succumbed to a separate, undiagnosed illness, such as cancer or cirrhosis of the liver. Local residents began referring to the hospital as Starvation Heights because the hungry, frail, and skeletal patients could be seen wandering around, looking for food and help. Furthermore, Hazard was known to steal the belongings of her patients after death, and often had them sign over their estates before their demise. It is believed that Hazard killed her first patient in 1902, long before she published her first book. The patient's post-mortem showed they had died from starvation, and the local coroner attempted to have Hazard prosecuted. Bizarrely, however, because she wasn't licensed to practice medicine, she was not able to be held accountable for her actions. She was reportedly vague when asked about the patient's missing jewelry. Just as her divorce was finalized, Hazard met Samuel Christman Hazard, a former military man. Samuel had ruined his career in the army by misappropriating army funds. He was often described as a drunk, a lech, and a swindler, making him a good match for Hazard and her callous ways. After they married, Samuel spent two years in prison as he'd failed to divorce at least one of his wives. One of Hazard's earliest patients was a woman named Gertrude Young. Gertrude had been looking for a cure after she'd been left partially paralyzed following a stroke. She had been left without the function of one leg and one arm. Hazard convinced Gertrude that she had a remedy, promising that a 40-day fast would bring back her mobility. Gertrude, who was clearly desperate and willing to try anything to regain what she'd lost post-paralysis, agreed to the fast and began treatment. A friend accompanied the woman to the hospital and stayed with her as she was instructed each day by Hazard or her nurses. Gertrude was not allowed to eat food, but could consume small amounts of liquid, often consisting of tomato broth or strained orange juice. 30 days into Gertrude's 40-day fast, she was found shaking, sweating, and throwing up what is described as a thick, dark substance. Although it was winter and the temperature was biting outside, Hazard had the windows to the room opened. She insisted her patient needed fresh air, but it seemed to make Gertrude all the more ill. Gertrude's companion called her usual doctor, the one who had helped her manage since becoming paralyzed. The doctor explained that Hazard's alleged cure was never going to work and that Gertrude needed to stop fasting immediately. Despite this, however, Gertrude refused to listen to her doctor. Hazard had been so convincing that Gertrude was sure she would be cured if she could just make it another 10 days. But Gertrude Young did not make it. She died on day 39. Hazard, however, was not charged with murder or even manslaughter, as Gertrude was seen to have made the decision to continue with the fast herself, since she had opted not to listen to her doctor's advice. Hazard was not intimidated either. She continued to treat patients at her establishment in the exact same way, completely unfazed by her brush with the law. On March 28, 1910, Earl Edward Erdman, a civil engineer based in Seattle, died from starvation in the Seattle General Hospital. Notably, he had kept a diary of his time at Wilderness Heights, and he'd written down the details of Hazard's methods during the weeks he was in her care. Beginning February 1st and spanning the entire month, Earl ate less than one meal a day. On his very first day at the hospital, his dinner and supper each consisted of mashed soup dinner. Five days later, he had the same, this time with one orange for breakfast. Two weeks into his treatment, he had only two oranges for breakfast and no dinner or any supper. Over the next few days, he was given one cup of soup per day. Around February 16th, Earl noted, slept better last night, head quite dizzy, eyes yellow streaked and red. Five days later, he detailed that he was suffering from backache just below his ribs and slept poorly that night. By the end of February, he had mentioned having a kind of frontal headache, pain in his right side, below his ribs, and pain below his ribs in his back. His diet, generally consisting of tomato broth, oranges, and strained orange juice, never changed up to his hospitalization on March 28th. 
Two other patients of Hazard were wealthy heiresses with property in the US, Canada, and Australia. Claire and Dorothy Williamson had been orphaned as children and both dealt with hypochondria, often spending large sums of cash for medical care they didn't really need. At the time of the sisters' arrival, though, Wilderness Heights was not finished being built. As a result, they were treated in an apartment in Seattle, Washington. Their treatment was somehow even more grotesque than that of Gertrude Young. The two women were starved, beaten, and subjected to needless, hours-long enemas. Nurses would later state that as a part of the inpatient's treatment plans, they were to undergo massages, but that these massages often sounded more like violent physical assaults. The two sisters eventually became so frail that they struggled to walk. Neighbors in the apartment complex recalled hearing them crying and screaming. Hazard knew that they were becoming aware that something odd was going on in the apartment, so she ended up placing them on gurneys and having them moved from the building to her unfinished hospital in Olala. The two women had been starved so greatly they had become delirious. Hazard, though, as cold and callous as she was, decided that this was the perfect opportunity to make herself an extraordinarily wealthy woman. Writing new wills for the sisters, Hazard appointed herself as both their legal guardian and the beneficiary of their estate, valued at over $500,000. Furthermore, she stole the pair's jewelry and valuables, estimated to be worth around $6,000, wore their clothes, and stopped the two from being able to see and speak with each other. It is unclear how, but word emerged that the two were in trouble when Dorothy managed to contact the sister's previous governess. The governess, though, was based in England, although some sources state it was Australia, and by the time she arrived in Washington, Claire had already passed away. She had weighed less than 50 pounds at the time of her death. Hazard attempted to shift the blame, claiming that drugs administered to Claire as a child had caused her internal organs to shrink and led to cirrhosis of the liver. The governess was aghast when she saw the body and noted that Dorothy looked close to death herself. She eventually had the remaining sister removed from Hazard's care after some struggle. She would have to contact one of the sister's uncles, a wealthy man named John Herbert, who lived in Portland, Oregon, to initiate the move. After haggling with Hazard, John paid almost $1,000 for the release of his niece. After securing Dorothy's safety, he turned to Lucian Agassiz, the British vice consul in Tacoma, and together they began to look into Hazard. They discovered she was connected with the deaths of numerous wealthy individuals, and many of these high society members had signed their riches over before their deaths. One such victim was an Englishman named John Ivan Flux. He had come to the US to buy a ranch, and yet when he died in Hazard's care, he had only $70 to his name. Furthermore, a New Zealander named Eugene Wakelin reportedly shot himself while he was an inpatient at Wilderness Heights. Before his death, Hazard had managed to become the administrator of his estate and drained all his money. On August 15th, 1911, Kitsap County law enforcement arrested Hazard for the first degree murder of Claire Williamson. Her trial began in January of 1912 and facility employees, including nurses, testified against Hazard, noting that the sisters endured scorching baths and frequently suffered through enormous pain at the hands of Hazard, who had been dubbed the Starvation Doctor. During the trial, the public was also made aware of Hazard's tendency to financially drain all of her victims. The prosecution called it financial starvation. The doctor showed no remorse or regret and took no responsibility for Claire's demise. In her first book, Hazard wrote, Death in the fast never results from deprivation of food, but is the inevitable consequence of vitality, sapped to the last degree by organic imperfection. And she stuck by that, even while on trial for murder. She claimed she was being attacked because she was a successful woman and because she practiced unconventional medicine that traditional doctors disapproved of. But still, the jury did not believe much of what Hazard had to say at her trial. After briefly deliberating, she was found guilty of manslaughter and was ultimately sentenced to between two and 20 years in prison. Additionally, her medical license was revoked. She spent her brief stint behind bars at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, serving just two years before being released on parole on December 26, 1915. The following year, Governor Ernest Lister, incredibly, gave Hazard a full pardon though her medical license was never reinstated. 
Accompanied by her husband, Hazard left the US and moved to New Zealand, where she continued to work as a dietitian and alternative medical practitioner. However, in 1917, a local newspaper revealed that Hazard's medical license only allowed her to practice in Washington. As she used the title doctor, she was subsequently charged in Auckland for practicing medicine while not registered to do so. She was found around 600 New Zealand dollars for this crime. Three years later though, Hazard returned to Alala. She opened a new facility here, but this time she called it a school of health as her medical license had been revoked. Despite its name change, the establishment essentially operated in the same way that Wilderness Heights did, and Hazard continued to oversee fasts until the facility burned to the ground in 1935. It was never rebuilt. Although Linda Hazard was only ever charged with one case of manslaughter, she is often seen today as a serial killer due to the numerous patients who perished while under her care, adhering to the supposed treatment plan she had laid out for them. Between 1908 and 1912, Hazard is believed to have been responsible for the deaths of at least 16 people, including Earl Erdman, Claire Williamson, and Louis E. Rader, an American politician who underwent a 29-day fast at Hazard's advice. Rader was reportedly the original owner of the land where Hazard's Wilderness Heights facility was built. It is entirely possible that Hazard was responsible for far more deaths than we know. Ironically, she died at the age of 70 on June 24, 1938, after deciding to undergo fasting in an attempt to cure an illness she had. She passed away from starvation, just as many of her patients did. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.